right? Uh, so, interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started right now. All right, so uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, Jerry Huang from University of Washington. I want to welcome everybody back to Controversies in Hand Surgery, Hand Fellowship Virtual Debate, and really one of the uh, Thank Dr. Hammer and Dr. Neversetch last week for an excellent job. Um, not able to join, but was able to watch the recording and another great job by all the fellows, the moderator, as well as the mentors. So I think what's been great about this, I think everybody's hopefully able to return slowly back to clinic and ORs, but I certainly really enjoyed this opportunity to learn from faculty from across the country and learn different perspectives. I think collegiality has been kind of you know, unbelievable across the board. I think every week I'm amazed at how great a job the fellows do. It's certainly an amazing job on the presentation, the content, and the delivery. The mentors and moderators can't do this without you guys, so thank you so much. And then the last couple of weeks, we switched to a new format, so kind of a longer overview by the moderator and also introduction. It also allow for a lot more time for discussion, and uh, Dr. Yao today is going to be uh, adding a participant poll to, poll to this to try and kind of gauge what people would do. So as we kind of get ready for the face off between the different institutions, I think this week is more like a cage match. Uh, we have five different institutions in the cage, uh, very, very strong believers in, in their technique. And this is gonna be moderated by Dr. Yao out of Stanford. And it's gonna be University of Colorado versus Columbia versus the Mayo Clinic, Philadelphia Hand Center and HSS. From there, I'm gonna pass it off to Jeff Yao. Thanks, Jerry. All right, let's see. Can you see me okay? Jerry, are my slides up? You're good. Yep, yep you're yep, good. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Jerry. And thanks, Jerry and Warren, for. Um, continuing to uh, set up these great uh, educational opportunities during this uh, crisis. Uh, I hope everyone and their loved ones are staying safe and well. Um, so I've been tasked to be the moderator for this uh, discussion slash debate. Uh, we'll talk about the chronic scapulonate ligament injury. The debate rages on. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the chronic scapulonate ligament injury where the ligament's no longer reparable. So we're outside of that six to eight to 10 week window where the ligament's still reparable, but it's not to the point where the patients develop slack arthritis. And unfortunately, we get a fair number of patients who show up in this phase, in this stage. So here's our case. So this may or may not be uh, based on true events. Uh, we have a 31-year-old hand fellow fell off her bicycle on the way to the hospital to go for, in for a replant. She thought she just, quote unquote, sprained her right dominant wrist. She had dorsal central wrist pain. This persisted for months, but she was afraid to get it checked out out of fear of scorn from her fellowship director. Six months later, she told her highly supportive hand fellowship director who, who urged her to get some films. And this is what she got. So now this is six months after her injury. MRI, similar results. So she wanted to continue with fellowship uh, with minimal time off. So she elected to have a wrist arthroscopy, debridement, and denervation procedure. Upon wrist arthroscopy, showed a wide scapulonate interval. Drive through sign, the capitates viewed through the uh, uh, via the radiocarpal joint. So if you look at Will Geisler's arthroscopic classification, this would be a, a, a stage four uh, tear, or the IWAS classification, a stage four tear as well. So suffice it to say, the denervation failed. She couldn't operate. She just signed a deal to become a new hand surgeon at, the, at a prominent academic center. She was hired to be the new hotshot wrist specialist, and she, quote, unquote, needs a wrist to be able to operate. In case you were considering a salvage, she had family members that had both this scaphoid excision four corner fusion and PRC with dismal results, so she was not interested in either of those options. So we're talking about Mark Arcielias's um, stage three slash four. This is where the ligaments disrupted. 
This is where the scaphoid is still normally aligned. And most importantly, the carpal mal malalignment is easily reducible. And the cartilages of both the radial carpal and MC joints are normal. So this is before the scaphoids and lunate has uh, fallen into the fixed easy deformity. The joint is still reducible. So what are your options in this situation? Uh, we already spoke about denervation. Historically, capsule VCs uh, were popular. And then as you can see, there's a number of different scaphalunate ligament reconstruction procedures that have been described. This is not even an exhaustive list. Um, and as the saying goes, when there's multiple ways to treat one problem, either they all work, as in the case for thumb CMC arthritis, or they all don't work. And unfortunately, in this situation, none of these procedures, in my mind, has definitively um, dis distinguished itself from the others as being the true gold standard. But maybe uh, we'll be convinced of that of, of other, otherwise today. So we'll be talking about these five techniques. So what do we do now in this situation? So get ready for the battle of the acronyms and let's meet our combatants. And please forgive me if I had a little bit of fun with this. It's been a long uh, time of quarantine with my, with my family. So I took a little time to have a little fun with this. So the first group will be from Columbia. We'll be talking about the Razzle. This is Dr. Kelly Esposito and Mel the Gladiator Rosenwasser. Sorry, Mel, I had to do something with the facial hair, I think. What about the 3LT? That would be Christopher Chen and Alex the Marauder Lauder from the University of Colorado. The Swivelock SL Reconstruction with Remy Rabinovich and Mark the Ravager Recant from the Philadelphia Hands, Hand to Shoulder Center. More acronyms, the SLIP procedure, Dr. Laura D Lauren Dutton and Sanj the Centaur Kakar. Nice abs there, Sanj from the Mayo Clinic. And last, the Anafab from, with Genevieve Rambo and Scott, this was too easy, the Werewolf from HSS. Probably the friendliest werewolf you, you'll see. After the present, uh, presentation, Jerry's gonna put up a poll and I request all the participants to answer two short questions at the end of the uh, presentations. And so with that, hopefully the audio plays. All right, so I think our first speaker will be Dr. Esposito from Columbia. If you wanna go ahead and share your screen. All right. All right, can y'all see that? Yes. Great, okay. Thumbnails gone. Okay, so um, up first, uh, we will be making the case for the RASL procedure. Um, I'm Kelly Esposito, I'm the fellow at Columbia, and my mentor is Dr. Rosenwasser, who I'd like to thank for his help with this presentation and his help uh, in mentoring me for this entire year. So as uh, was already mentioned, this is clearly the battle of the acronyms. And I think the one acronym that we're really going for here is the GOAT. And seen here, uh, a GOAT is shooting the illest album of 2020, and we're here to argue that the GOAT in this situation is the Russell. So a uh, similar case is the one that was presented. This is a 40-year-old young person, chronic um, SL instability causing pain, weakness, and functional limitation. Um, I won't belabor any of the um, anatomical points um, about this as obviously this audience is very well familiar with this problem. However, I will point out one uh, salient point, uh, which is um, that there are 20 degrees of relative motion between the scaphoid and the lunate. The scaphoid continues to flex after the lunate stops, and so it's important to be able to replicate this physiological um, motion. Uh, and if you tie the two bones together too tightly, you will lose that. So there's many options, most of which are uh, interesting acronyms, and we'll hear about five of them today, and our preferred treatment is the RASL. So uh, to frame this debate, um, we like to hearken back to a well-known surgeon of yesteryear, Dr. Codman, uh, who essentially um, invented the idea of follow-up. And so um, on that vein, what kind of follow-up do we have for today's contenders? In a quick review of the literature, the 3LT has some medium-term, uh, short-term, 
follow-up available. The ANAFAB has some preliminary outcome uh, available in the literature. And the other two procedures today have some biomechanical studies and technical guides, but no published uh, cohorts of follow-up yet. Um, here's a summary of the literature in descending order of the amount of follow-up um, that's published in the literature at this time. Um, and we would be very interested in having this debate perhaps again in 10 years when we had more long-term follow-up. But alas, we're doing this now. Um, and we have 20 plus years of follow-up on the RASL procedure. This um, was first described in 1997 and we've been following uh, the patient since. So to go over the RASL procedure, the concept is like an axle. And as I um, mentioned, it's important to preserve some of the physiologic motion between the scaphoid and the lunate. And as you will hear from uh, no doubt my colleagues today, um, it's important to, uh, to preserve both the dorsal and the volar components as this is a really strong, um, uh, this is a, quite a lot of force that goes through this joint. The RASL achieves this by going through the center and creating an axle. And so it actually supports both dorsally and volarly. I'll quickly go over the technique and then I'll go over this step by step. Um, so this is done through two incisions, a longitudinal dorsal incision in addition to a radial styloid incision over the first dorsal compartment. Uh, we do a capsular uh, or a ligament sparing uh, capsular approach and we work through two windows. We use joysticks to um, reduce uh, the scaphoglunate interval and then place a screw uh, down the axis. And the trajectory of the screw is paramount to the success of this procedure as I will go into. So you start with your dorsal incision, make sure to um, preserve the dorsal ligaments and Dr. Wolf has actually uh, done um, great biomechanical research um, emphasizing the importance of maintaining these attachments. Um, the other incision is over the radial styloid and it's imperative that you perform a radial styloidectomy to get the correct starting point and I'll go into that a bit in a moment but this is a key point to this procedure. You then perform reduction and association of the scaphoid and lunate by placing K-wires um, into the uh, respective bones reducing the uh, lunate under the capitate and making sure these K-wires are out of the trajectory of your screw which is a little tricky at first but um, practiced hand surgeons can certainly get the hang of it. Um, it's important to not skip this step either. The um, burring of the subchondral uh, or to the subchondral um, surfaces of the two bones to be able to get a fibrous neoligament scar response. Again, this is not a fusion procedure, so we want some physiological motion, but it's important to get a healing response. This is an important step. You then use a coker clamp to maintain your reduction. And after your radial styloidectomy, as you can see was done here, you place your guide wire on the correct axis. And the correct axis of this screw is exactly parallel to the inclination of the distal radius, as you can see here on the PA x-ray. And then in the sagittal plane, you want to aim right at the center of the lunate or aim slightly volar. It's very important to not um, place the screw dorsal. So again, to recap, the critical technical points of this procedure are perform a radial styloidectomy, or it's not possible to get the correct starting point for the screw. The correct starting point for the screw is at or proximal to the dorsal lateral ridge of the scaphoid. And in the example that was shown at the very beginning, actually that starting point was a bit distal. Um, the axis of the screw is directed toward the center of the lunate, as I mentioned, and you never want to place the screw too dorsal. Screw placement is fundamental to the success of this procedure, and we would argue that that's fun that correct technique and adherence to rigorous um, standards is important to the success of any orthopedic procedure. And we aren't the only people saying this. Um, Dr. Hausman uh, published on the screw placement and the importance of the starting point, um, and it, with a distal starting point uh, that, that's associated with failure. So what this means is if the screw is in the wrong place or steps are skipped, you're not doing a wrestle. Maybe you're doing some sort of modification, but it's not the wrestle as we're describing it here. And so uh, to take a page out of the book of uh, B. Rabbit seen here on the left in the finale of the movie Eight Mile, he was also selected to go first. And his strategy was to um, anticipate the critiques that his opponent, Papa Doc, would be leveraging at him. And so in that vein, uh, I have a, a few papers I'd like to um, clarify here. Um, the first uh, is this paper by Dr. Stern, um, which concluded that the, the RASL procedure was ineffective in providing stability about the SL interval. However, um, you can see there were no radial styloidectomies performed in this. There were no lateral x-rays included, so we don't know where the screw was in the sagittal plane. Um, and the starting point is too distal. So we would argue this was not the RASL procedure that was performed here. Similarly, uh, Dr. El Hassan's article um, concluded that this procedure has a high rate of early failure and reoperation. However, uh, there is a tremendous amount of variation in the types of screws, lengths of screws, and placement of the screws, whether or not a styloidectomy was performed. So there is sort of a heterogeneous mix of things that were done. And actually, to quote the article itself, uh, they believe that the failures may have been due to the challenges of the screw placement as opposed to a problem with the procedure itself if done, if done uh, in the described way. 
okay, so let's say we followed the steps and put the screws and put the screw in the correct place. How do these do? Well, at that point, the proof is really in the pudding. We have the longest published follow-up of, um, of chronic static SL instability at an average of about 10 and a half years, 35 patients ranging from one to 24 years. They maintain 80% of their motion and grip strength and the reduction was maintained over that time as well. Here are a couple of case examples. This is a patient at almost 19 years. This is one at 20 years and here he is in the office and you can see his range of motion. And then as Dr. Sandow mentioned, the gold standard is really the ability to do a push-up. And you can see this patient would do as many push-ups as uh, we wanted him to in the office. So back to our case, we were very careful to place the screw in the ideal position. As described earlier, radial styloidectomy was done, subchondral burring was done to create the neo uh, ligament uh, healing response. And you can notice that the starting point is in the correct position proximal to the dorsal lateral ridge of the scaphoid. Three months post-op, screw is in the same place. And I will note it's actually, uh, it's expected to have a little bit of lucency um, due to the physiologic motion. This, is, this stays uh, stable and does not progress. Here uh, he is in the office. And then here's the patient at nine years with essentially equal uh, grip strength uh, bilaterally. Um, at this point, I thank you for your attention and I would like to uh, pass the mic to my colleagues. Wow, with the, uh, with the mic drop and everything, that's impressive. Thank you, Kelly. All right, so we'll move on. Um, uh, our next speaker will be Chris Chen from the University of Colorado. Chris, there you go. All right, guys, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. All right. All right. My name is Chris Chen. I'm one of the hand fellows at the University of Colorado. I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, 3LT technique for uh, cell dissociation. And uh, I don't actually have any conflicts of interest in this case because I've never actually seen one before um, because this isn't actually performed at our institution routinely. All right, so we all know the basics of um, SL ligaments, you know, the proximal rows and intercalated segment doesn't have any muscular tendinous attachments, and lunate is held balanced in the neutral position because of the flexion of the scaphoid um, and the extension of the tracheotrum. And of course, if you disrupt the SL ligament, it's a crucial link between the scaphoid and the lunate, and when it gets disrupted, you get slack wrist, right? Well, it's actually not that simple uh, because we often forget about the secondary stabilizers such as the STT ligament and the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, which also play an important role in stabilizing the proximal row. A more complete way to think about this injury is that complete SL injury, in addition to failure of the secondary stabilizers, uh, leads to abnormal kinematics and then eventually slack wrist. So as Dr. Yao mentioned, these injuries often present chronic and they're uh, often at six to eight, greater than six to eight weeks out from their injury. And at that point, repair isn't a good option. Unfortunately, there's no gold standard technique. However, there are a lot of non-gold standard techniques, and this is a small sampling of the main techniques out there. And uh, you know, we're running out of acronyms for all the uh, treatment options. Um, props to uh, the Razzle Dazzle crew. Um, that's a pretty cool one. Uh, the slit technique is also uh, a pretty cute name too. So the 3LT technique was first published by Garcia Elias uh, in uh, general hand surgery in 2006. It's indicated for complete injuries with non-repairable ligaments where the deformity is still reducible and ideally there's minimal or no arthritis. The technique has three goals in mind. So the first is to reconstruct the dorsal SL ligament. The second goal is to augment the palmar distal connections to the scaphoid, that is the palmar SCT ligaments. And the third goal is to reduce ulnar translation of the lunate. So the technique actually incorporates elements of three previously described techniques. And when you're trying to com compare these techniques, it's kind of like playing spot the difference. So I made it easy for you in red. So in red are um, the elements from each of these methods that are incorporated into the 3LT technique. So the original Brunelli technique weaves a slip of the FCR uh, through a hole of the distal scaphoid and tenodesis across the radial carpal joint, which um, theoretically could lead to um, some wrist stiffness. The Linshai technique is similar, uses the ECRV, However, um, it's different in that it uses the, the dorsal radio triquetral ligament as a pulley and it does not cross the radiocarpal joint. The Vanden Abiel technique uh, also uses the FCR 
and it incorporates the pulley um, described by Linscheid. Um, so it doesn't cross the uh, radial carpal joint. So the 3LT technique takes the best elements of each of these techniques and it weaves the FCR down the long axis of the scaphoid and this helps to augment the SCT ligament as well as the dorsal radial triquetral ligament and it doesn't cross the radial carpal joint. So to perform the technique, you begin with a standard dorsal approach. Uh, you do a burger ligament sparing capsulotomy and you want to make sure you leave enough of the dorsal radial triquetral ligament uh, such that you can make a pulley in the later steps. Next, through a separate incision, you harvest a eight centimeter distally based strip of FCR. You then weave it through a drill hole uh, in the long axis of the scaphoid. And this is a crucial step because this is the step that augments uh, the volar STT ligament. You then create a trough in the lunate with a burr. You drop a suture anchor in there and this is gonna help the tendon heal to the bone. Then you localize your um, dorsal radio triquetral ligament. You create a slit, you pass the tendon through, reduce the proximal row, lock it down with K-wires from the scaphoid to the capitate and the scaphoid to the lunate. And you tighten everything down, uh, including the suture anchor, and you sew the ligament back on itself. So it's the best technique because it reconstructs the dorsal SL ligament. It augments the palmar SCT ligament and it doesn't cross the radial carpal joint. And theoretically, this recreates normal carpal kinematics and theoretically, it prevents slack wrist. So that's the theory, but how does it actually do in real life? So this is a compilation of eight different studies um, and it includes both the 3LT technique as well as the Van Nabil technique, which is very, very similar. And the original series by Garcia Elias um, followed 38 patients for four years. 74% of them had no pain at rest. 21% had some pain with loading and 5% had chronic pain. We'll just, we'll just ignore those 5%. Um, two patients experienced recurrence of carpal collapse and 24% um, progressed to, to arthritis. However, most of it was mild um, in 18% of the cases. And there were very few complications and no cases of avascular necrosis. Overall, other studies have been able to replicate this success, which is important. Um, other case series range from eight patients to 117 patients with follow-up anywhere between 10 months to 14 years. And most series demonstrate that pain improvement can be achieved pretty consistently, and the incidence of chronic pain or unchanged pain is between five to 27%. With regard to radiographic parameters, the SL angle is typically improved to somewhere between 54 to 68 degrees. Um, however, loss of reduction and increased SL gap at the final follow-up is not uncommon. Range of motion and grip strength are also reasonable, uh, with 75 to 85% of the pre-op motion being preserved and grip strength approaching 65 to 85% of the contralateral side. So overall, the instance of, the pro of progression of uh, arthritis is relatively low, and actually the highest uh, um, rate of uh, progression was uh, reported in the original series um, by Garcia Elias. And complication rates are very low, so you know, you all remember first do no harm, right? In conclusion, the 3LT technique is a reasonable technique. Like every other technique, 60% of the time works every time. It has a theoretical um, anatomic benefit. It also has a long track record, unlike a lot of the other techniques you'll be hearing about today. It has a low complication rate, unlike certain screws which may loosen over time. And whether or not you like the technique or not, it's a classic technique to know about, and it's um, been used as a benchmark, and it's commonly cited in pretty much every subsequent article about the topic. So for our young hotshot hand fellow hoping to become a wrist specialist, I think it's a good uh, option because it's gonna help her preserve some range of motion, it's gonna help her preserve pain, and hopefully it's gonna slow her progression of slack wrist until at least she can get her hands on some good disability insurance. Thank you. Very nicely done, Chris. Um, Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Rabinovich will uh, discuss this swivel lock reconstruction. Nice. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, so. Uh, my name is Remy Rabinovich, and uh, I'm from the Philly, uh, 
from the Philadelphia Hand Center, and I, along with my mentor, Mark Recant, will be defending the all dorsal SLE construction with internal brace. So the treatment of uh, stage three and four SL instability has led to the development of a vast arsenal of treatment options. Uh, as Kelly and Chris nicely talked about, the RASL and the 3LT are just two of the many ways to tackle this problem, uh, none of which has proven to be the gold standard. The RASL, which was introduced in the late 90s, uh, really has not stood the test of time. It's been associated with uh, several complications, including revision surgery for painful progressive screw lucency, the inability to maintain initial deformity correction, the development and progression of degenerative changes, and AVN of the scapegoat has also been reported. This has led to several institutions, including Peter Stern's group out of Cincinnati, as well as um, an institution out of France, to acknowledge that uh, they've stopped using this technique altogether for uh, SL dissociation. The 3LT, along with the earlier modifications of the Brunelli procedure, have overall demonstrated variable short-term clinical outcomes. Marcus C. Elias uh, noted that 18% of his patients develop progressive degenerative changes. In a more recent report out of France, the authors also noted that 20% of the patients develop arthritis, along with uh, diminished post-operative uh, range of motion and the inability to hold that reduced SL interval and uh, SL angle, as well as a 35% incidence of palmar pain likely related to that anterior and posterior approach required for this technique. The newer techniques out there, such as the 316 adhesis and the uh, anatomic front and back uh, repair have sparse published clinical outcomes. They're technically pretty complicated and uh, they require multiple incisions and front and back approaches, which as just alluded to in the previous slide, is not necessarily benign. So moving forward, what can we learn from the literature as well as our experience with the RASL, the 3LT, and the numerous ten uh, other tendon weave ligament reconstructions available? Well, firstly, uh, reconstructing uh, the torn ligament solely with a tendon autograph does not match the native ligament's viscoelastic properties, and this leads to creep and delayed elongation. On the other extreme, placing a screw across the SL interval may create too rigid of a construct, which eventually leads to eccentric loading on that screw and possible lucency. The all dorsal SL reconstruction with internal brace provides that balance between not being too rigid or too elastic to restore stability. This technique has gained popularity while still in its infancy. It aims to reconstruct that thicker dorsal uh, portion of the SL ligament while stabilizing the skateboard out of flexion pronation and the lunate out of extension. A proposed advantage is that it's a biologic reconstruction using a two to three millimeter slip of ECRL or ECRB that's reinforced with a robust one three millimeter suture which basically acts as a brace while the tendon heals into the bone. So this helps uh, preserve that near physiologic motion between the scaphoid and the lunate while not being too elastic uh, given the strong static suture tape. This technique is quick, it's simple, only utilizing a single dorsal incision as opposed to the four other techniques discussed today, which not only require multiple incisions, but most of them uh, require you to drill completely across one or more carpal bones and shuttle the graft through numerous bony tunnels and or ligaments. In a recent uh, review um, on, on various SL reconstruction techniques, uh, the authors noted that this was the preferred technique at their respective institutions. They illustrated a case of a former NFL player with painful SL instability. You can see the widened gap on the clenched fist, clenched fist views all the way to the right. At two years post-op, the patient was pain-free and demonstrated excellent wrist range of motion. His grip strength on the operative side was 170 kilograms, and on the contralateral side, it was 160. These are his films at two years post-op, and you can appreciate the maintenance of a reduced SL interval and no progression of degenerate changes. So in summary, the all-dorsal SL reconstruction with internal brace 
is a simple and quick biologic reconstruction aimed to restore the stronger dorsal portion of a scapulonate ligament while stabilizing the carpus out of a flexible DZ deformity. It provides a satisfactory balance between not being too rigid or too elastic, which has limited earlier reconstruction attempts. That's all I got. I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Mark Recant, uh, David Zalouf, and Steve Lee for uh, helping me out. Thank you, Remy. Uh, nice job. Okay, uh, let's move on to the Mayo Clinic uh, with Lauren Dutton, who will discuss the slit procedure. Uh, Remy, I think you might have to stop sharing. Oh, there we go. Good evening from Rochester, Minnesota, where it has finally stopped snowing. My name is Lauren Dutton. I am a hand fellow at Mayo Clinic, <clears throat> and I will be discussing the SL360 procedure as described by my mentor, Dr. Kakar. Dr. Kakar would like to acknowledge several individuals whose work led to the development of this procedure, including Drs. Berger, Garcia Elias, and Ho. We would also like to thank Dr. Huang, Dr. Hammert, and Dr. Yao for all they have done to put together these interfellowship cross-country Zoom debates, which have been educational as well as entertaining. <clears throat> Quite a bit has changed over the past year, but some things have remained the same. As hand surgeons, our charge remains to attempt to prevent the x-ray from this case presented to us by Dr. Yao from evolving into this one. Doing so can be easier said than done, as reflected by the wide variety of techniques that have been employed over the years to address the problem of scapolunate dissociation. So where do we begin when we approach a case of scapolunate instability? Dr. Garcia, Elias, and colleagues have provided us with a useful roadmap in taking stock of SL injuries and planning treatment. To remember these factors, <clears throat> Dr. Kakar has created the mnemonic SCARCE, a term that took on a whole new meaning during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. The S stands for the integrity of the secondary stabilizers, as per Dr. Wolf's recent work, the, uh, in order to create a DZ deformity, more than just the SL ligament must be disrupted. The C is for cartilage status, as this will influence our decision of whether to reconstruct the SL ligament versus consider other options. A is for alignment of the carpus and specifically the position of the lunate and whether it is located within the lunate facet or ulnarly translocated. The R is for reducibility of the SL interval, which can be judged arthroscopically after debridement of scar tissue and use of a probe to visualize the reduction. C is for chronicity of the injury, which provides a surrogate, surrogate indicator of the quality of the ligament and its ability to be repaired. And finally, E is for the extent of the ligament injury, that is, whether it is partial versus complete. So once these factors are assessed, our next task is to come up with an appropriate treatment plan. One common method for addressing SL ligament reconstruction is to focus solely on the dorsal SL ligament. And indeed, the work of Dr. Berger has shown us that the breaking strength of the dorsal SL ligament is close to 300 newtons, whereas the palmar ligament provides 120 newtons. It's important to remember that while less than the dorsal ligament, this is still a substantial component of stability. <clears throat> Furthermore, if we only reconstruct the dorsal ligament in the presence of a complete ligament tear, not only will we only be halfway there, but we are also at risk of gapping open the volar SL interval. This is akin to fixing a fractured dorsally that then gaps open volarly. Dr. Ho and others have contributed significantly to the evolution of a combined dorsal and volar reconstruction by describing their techniques of reducing the SL interval and performing, performing a box type reconstruction with a free tendon graft followed by pinning. And these authors have shown favorable results. So the question becomes, can we take this concept of addressing both the dorsal and volar ligament disruption and at the same time improve upon it by eliminating K-wires, minimizing post-operative immobilization and addressing the secondary stabilizers that we know to be critical? So let's return to our case of this patient with a complete irreparable SL tear and a reducible SL interval. How can we help fix her wrist so that she can go back to fixing other people's wrists? Our approach would be to perform an SL360 reconstruction as follows. We begin by approaching the dorsal wrist via a ligament sparing capsulotomy as described by Dr. Berger. K wires are inserted into the scaphoid and lunate and used to assess the reducibility of the SL interval. 
Once this is confirmed, the wrist is flipped volarly and approached via an extended carpal tunnel incision. If present, a palmaris longus autograft is harvested. If not, a plantaris allograft tendon is recommended. The graft is whip stitched at each end with a 4 braided non-absorbable suture. If there is no DZ present, 4-5K wires are placed parallel to each other through the scaphoid and lunate from dorsal to palmar. In the presence of a DZ deformity, the trajectory of the scaphoid pin is from dorsal distal to palmar proximal in order to correct the deformity. A 3 millimeter drill hole is created in the lunate and a 2.5 millimeter hole is made in the scaphoid to permit a single passage of the graft through the scaphoid with the larger hole placed in the lunate to eventually accommodate the second passage of the graft. A suture passer is used to first pass the graft from dorsal to volar through the lunate, then volar to dorsal through the scaphoid. And finally, from dorsal to volar back through the lunate, thereby completing the 360 tenodesis. The graft is tensioned and the wrist is cycled through a passive range of motion to decrease creep. The graft is then secured within both the scaphoid and the lunate with bioabsorbable interference screws placed from dorsal to volar. Through the tenodesis screw holes, a 1.3 millimeter diameter synthetic tape is passed from dorsal to volar through the scaphoid and the lunate, and then tied palmarly. The passage of the tape through the screws, rather than directly over the bone, prevents the tape from cutting out through the carpus. All K wires are removed. To control flexion of the scaphoid, the dorsal limb of the graft can be tethered to the distal pole of the scaphoid. In the case of this patient, who also had ulnar translocation of the lunate, the extra tail passed volarly through the lunate was used to reconstruct the long radial lunate ligament via a suture anchor placed into the distal radius. The capsule is closed with 2O non-absorbable suture with great care taken to repair the dorsal radiocarpal ligament back down to the carpus. The patient is immobilized in a short arm splint postoperatively and rehab has begun at three to four weeks. This MRI was obtained at the three year follow-up mark for a patient who underwent an SL360 reconstruction. A recent biomechanical study compared the stiffness and maximum load to failure of a 360 tenodesis alone as compared to one augmented with tape and found a two-fold increase in the maximum load to failure of reconstruction when augmented with tape, thereby rendering it nearly the same as that of the native dorsal SL ligament. Mark Twain told us that to a person with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Accordingly, we would submit that as per Dr. Garcia Elias's work, not every SL injury is the same. And thus, we need a variety of tools in our armamentarium to address them. We propose the SL360 as one such tool. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lauren, a very uh, much more diplomatic uh, presentation. Thank you very much, that was great. Okay, so we'll round it out uh, from New York again at HSS. Dr. Rambo, you have the floor. Um, we can see you. Are you on mute, Genevieve? Okay. Sorry, it hid my screen from me. Let me go back and see if this will work. Okay. Hopefully that's showing up. Yep. Um, all right. So uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Genevieve Rambeau. I'm from Hospital for Special Surgery. Um, thank you, everyone, for the chance to present. And a special thank you to my mentor, Dr. Scott Wolf, for his help with putting this together. So I'm going to talk about the anatomical front and back repair, which is a new technique for chronic SL disso uh, dissociation. This was pioneered by Dr. Michael Sandow in Australia, and we've been starting to do this at HSS. So the impetus for this technique was to address the other deformities incumbent with chronic SL injuries. I think the focus is often on the obvious SL diastasis, which often drives the treatments that were discussed tonight, with the focus on just reapproximating the scaphoid and the lunate. But that may not address the other issues, such as DC, scaphoid rotatory subluxation, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the dorsal scaphoid translation, which is the only radiographic parameter that correlates with postoperative pain. 
So we know that it takes more than the division of the SL alone to lead to DC and other main contributors um, for the wrist stability are the dorsal scapula lunate interosseous ligament, the STT, the long radial lunate, the DIC, and the DRC. So when thinking about a repair technique, ideally the goal of surgery would be to perform a true anatomic repair and to restore all the ligaments involved. Many of the procedures, like the first three, focus on reapproximation of the scaphoid and the lunate. The TLT adds one more step in restoration of the ST ligament, arguably plus or minus the DIC. Um, however, the new technique, the Anafab, additionally restores the critical long radial lunate ligament, as well as the other three that were mentioned. So this technique is a blend of multiple reconstructive procedures previously described, reconstructing those four important stabilizers of the wrist. It's indicated for SL diastasis and slack wrists or Garcia LIS stage four and five. The contraindications are fixed deformity, advanced arthritis, osteoporosis, and inflammatory arthritis. This is a two incision technique beginning with the dorsal approach to the wrist, a longitudinal incision through the third dorsal compartment. A window capsulotomy is performed preserving the DIC and the DRC. A volar FCR approach is performed and the trapezium is exposed and an anchor with suture tape is placed as shown in the schematics into the volar trapezium. The palmar carpus is exposed for the radial lunate tunnel along with the radial styloid if a styloidectomy is to be performed in conjunction. So now you have access to the volar and dorsal wrist. The scaphoid tunnel is then drilled from dorsal to volar with your index finger on the tubercle and the volar structure is well, prote well protected as seen as the image on the right. K-wire placement is confirmed on fluoroscopy and then using a three millimeter cannulated drill over K-wire, you create the scaphoid tunnel as shown here. The lunate tunnel is then drilled also from dorsal to volar, again, careful to protect the volar structures. And lastly, the radial tunnel is drilled from volar to dorsal, aiming to exit at the radial and proximal margins of Lister's tubercle. A three millimeter radial strip of the FCR tendon is harvested and dissected distally and well above the trapezium for accurate line of pull. The tendon and suture tape together are then passed sequentially through the tunnels and secured with interference screws at each segment. The first materials are passed from volar to dorsal through the scaphoid to recreate the STT. While holding tension, it is secured volarly in the scaphoid with an interference screw. A small trough is made in the dorsal scaphoid to allow tendon growth, and the tendon and taper then pass from the dorsal scaphoid through the dorsal lunate. Prior to tensioning, a knotted suture is placed in the dorsal lunate to allow for later reapproximation of the DIC, and the tendon, suture tape, and knotted suture are secured with an interference screw in the dorsal lunate. They're then passed from volar to dorsal through the distal radius to recreate the, the long radial lunate ligament and tension and secured in a similar fashion. A new modification to this is augmenting the repair with an additional suture bone anchor dorsally and proximally to the long radial lunate tunnel. This is a critical stabilizer to resist any pullout and act as a ripstop should failure occur along the way. Closure begins first with reapproximation of the dorsal ligaments and a pants over vest repair using that knotted chose suture that was dumped into the lunate. This is intraoperative fluoro showing reduction of the SL gap, restoration of the scapholunate angle and the radial lunate angle, and improvement of the dorsal scaphoid translation. And an important pre and post op imaging showing again the importance of, the, of correction of that dorsal scaphoid translation. Sorry about that. So post op patients are placed into a cast immobilization for six weeks, uh, some psycho optional. There are no K wires needed for stabilization. I'm not sure. This will play, but this is showing one of our patients at six my post op um, being able to do the push up. So, this, as mentioned before, there's not a lot of literature about this technique yet. Uh, it's relatively new. Dr. Sandow has published his small cohort 10 patients with a minimum two year follow up, showing excellent return of grip strength and motion. One patient was revised with an ulnar shortening osteotomy that had no further issues at the time of publication. Our own series here at HSS, we've done 14 patients with an average six month follow-up, arguably very short, um, but so far have shown a modest decrease in wrist range of motion and grip strength at early follow-up, although the uh, grip strength is not statistically significant. There was an improvement in the radiographic assessment of the SL angle with the gap and dorsal scapula translation. Um, we did have two complications. One was a patient with failure of fixation distally, and that was the impetus for adding that additional bone anchor, um, and the patient was converted successfully to a PRC. And one patient uh, with osteogenesis imperfecta ended up with a v uh, VC deformity, um, but had an improved scapulonate angle. So 
Um, in summary, yes, it's a very new technique. We don't have long-term data, um, but our preliminary studies are somewhat promising. So it'll be interesting to follow this technique as it continues to develop and as modifications are made. And um, I think hopefully it can offer one option for a very difficult problem in, in the risk that we still have not totally figured out. Um, thank you guys for your time. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all of our fellows, those were great uh, presentations. I applaud you all. And thank you to the mentors, uh, the, all the fellows were clearly well uh, coached. So thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do is to now, uh, I guess, Jerry, can you launch the poll? Or I guess the poll is already launched. I'm not ready to do it right now, hold on. So we'll take the poll on there? Yep, it's there. So we'll take about 30 seconds to just answer these two questions. Um, again, there are no losers here. There's only one winner. No, I'm just joking. Everyone's a winner here. But I'd love to see how the group feels in terms of these uh, procedures, which are all very promising. Uh, but the question is, has one distinguished itself as being more promising than any of the others. So we're about 50% voting so far. So I'm going to give it another few more seconds. It's looking close. Very close. Sanj, for a second, I thought that scarce was uh, referring to my golf shot hitting the uh, green. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll right now here, Jeff. Okay. All right, the poll is ending, and I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. Oh, uh, well, there you go. I'm glad we have a consensus, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody see the results from both questions on the poll on their screen? I can see them, uh, hopefully okay. everyone can see them. So it looks like- uh... Yeah, you know one, Jeff, come on. You can say it. Uh, so for in, if, for those of you, if you can't see, it looks like in terms of the most compelling argument, it looks like long-term follow-up trumps all. Um, and then the which procedure people would want done uh, looks like the swivel lock reconstruction if it were your own wrist. Interesting in hearing what the other uh, options would have been, whether that be denervation, or a salvage procedure. I purposely sort of uh, massaged the case a little bit such that denervation and the salvage procedure was not an option, but obviously I don't want to um, make the point, I wanna make the point that those clearly are good options as well. Okay, well, great. Thank you for your participation in the poll. Um, we're uh, down to 10 minutes, um, but I'd like to, take a moment to ask our mentors, um, Dr. Rosenwasser, Dr. Lauder, Dr. Recant, Dr. Kakar, and Dr. Wolf, um, two quite simple uh, questions. Number one, do you ever see a case of scapholunia dissociation, uh, which is still reducible and still reconstructible where you would not use your advocated technique and why? And number two, is there ever a situation when you would use one of the other proposed techniques? So Mel, what do you think? Is there ever a case where you would not use a RASL? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, so I, I pushed the envelope in some cases early on and these, they were patients that had some arthritis uh, in the mid carpal joint. And those were always uh, mistakes because those patients, even though they had better alignment, they had more discomfort, more pain, and they were actually probably made worse. Um, but I think if the right, if you have the right indication, I think it's doable. I think your question is, if there's ligament still there, would you just do a repair, even if it was late? Because I'm not quite sure that eight to 12 week uh, limit to repairs, because sometimes the ligament's still there. And I don't mean just the avulsion from the scaphoid, but but actually there's still ligament there. And I, I never, when I do this procedure, to breed any of the dorsal ligamentous structures, even if they don't look great. I mean, I use it as just part of a scar formation and I always leave it there. But what's interesting to me is that a lot of these techniques, uh, no matter what they're done, you could, they could still benefit from a stabilization. 
Um, and when I first started doing rassles, people kept saying, when do you want to take them out? So some people like to put these in and take them out after they've had sufficient biologic healing. So I don't have any, um, I don't take any issue with people that say they want to take it out. Although I've not done it because I haven't seen a lot of trouble with, um, with issues of the screw long term. Um, I know everybody, you know, sort of harps on the lucency, but you know, every one of these, you know, cases and, and techniques we saw, there's giant holes in the bone. I mean, what more lucency do you want? And there's three to four millimeter holes in the bone. So if you have a half a millimeter lucency around the threads of a screw, is that worse than a four millimeter hole in the bone? I, I don't think so. But so I don't think that's the issue. The issue is maintaining alignment. And I think the critical issue, and I, I agree with Scott Wolf, keeping the scaphoid proximal pole from dorsally subluxing and getting a lunate reduction, um, however you do it. I think that's the key to getting long-term results. And, and I've continued to do it and I follow the patients very carefully and I'm satisfied with the outcomes. Great, Alex? Yeah, so I think the first question you had was, uh, you know, if it's reducible, is there a technique that you would use in a different, you know, would you change the technique based on the patient? And um, so our patient population is a, is a tertiary, County hospital in a, in a large city, and uh, you know, for the labor who can't take time off of work, for the homeless patient with not, you know, it's not going to have good follow up or has, doesn't have resources, um, or the patient that can't participate in the adequate rehab that you need to truly kind of re repair, you know, have a good repair of that uh, biology, um, you know, something like injections, non operative treatment, uh, those things are definitely something to keep in mind. Um, other situations when uh, you might have to think outside the box a little bit is the patient with FCR tendinosis. Um, if you're going to use that FCR as a reconstructive model for your tendon and keep it attached to its um, insertion, uh, that, that's really something you have to think about, um, you know, looking at and, and really examining the patient ahead of time because if you're going to use that and it ruptures, that might compromise your, uh, your, your fixation. Um, other, other times when you know, I have to think outside the box or use a different method is uh, patients with a failed wrestle, a failed swivel lock, or a failed implant where you have to take that out and now you have huge holes in the bone um, and you might have to do something differently as well. So those are all kind of things to keep in mind. And obviously um, all the kind of key learning points that were mentioned before is having a flexible or reducible deformity. Uh, making sure you don't have any concomitant arthritic changes in the mid-carpal joint or the STT joint. Those are all things to, that, we might, that might sway your, your choices as well. Great. Thanks. Thanks for those comments. Mark? Uh, yeah, I would just echo what Alex was saying. And, uh, and now is, uh, I think it's helpful to have many tools in the toolbox. Um, this the technique it doesn't burn any bridges. Uh, it's not harvesting a tendon. Uh, it's not destroying a cartilage with a burr, uh, but uh, certainly I, I think the evidence, as it was demonstrated with excellent speakers, so thank you, is that if a patient had a, a strong inkling, whether a family member uh, advised them or a previous surgeon advised them of another technique that was described today, I don't think there's enough evidence that I would try to talk them out of that procedure given that I think there's some placebo effect with any of these procedures and believing uh, if the patient thinks that particular technique's best for them, then it's helpful to have other tools in your toolbox, so to speak. Okay, Saj? Uh, so I, I think there's a couple of thoughts. Uh, number one, I think, you know, from tonight, as, as Lauren and all the speakers have shown, you know, when you see a gap, a gap is not just a gap. There's many factors that you have to consider. Um, and Scott and Steve's work in New York has really shown a lot on what the ligaments have injured and what needs to be done. I think to answer your question, though, uh, there are uh, occasions, we did one uh, two days ago, where the patient, we scoped him, volally was stable and dorsally was gapping open. And so we did the Christoph Mathler in arthroscopic SL capsular adhesis. And, you know, uh, I saw his patients and his patients actually did really well with minimal morbidity and great motion. Now, yes, they gapped a little bit, but they were pain-free. So I think that that is a very useful technique. And I, and I tell the patients, I'll scope you. And if there's a big gap 
and I think you need a front back, we'll do it another time. I think it's a big operation that they have to get through. But if it's like we had the other day, Volody's intact, dorsally open, I think that's minimal morbidity operation. Uh, and if it fails, you can always do one of the things that we discussed. I think that's a great point. And, and not to beat a dead horse, but Scott and Steve from New York, uh, their work on the dorsal translation of the uh, proximal pole of the scaphoid, if that's controlled, I think that's clearly more important than closing the gap of the scapholunia interval. And that's why the capsule obesities uh, tend to work as well, albeit limiting range of motion. Thanks for those comments. All right, Scott, what do you think? Um, thanks, Jeff. Uh, first of all, I think it's tremendously exciting that we've got a conference like this going. Um, we, for years, have kind of treated this the same way, and I think there's a whole array of different ways to look at this now. And the challenge is for us to not just sort of pick what sounds best, but the challenge is, is really to study this now in large numbers. And the only way we can do that is to... Um, is to look at these stratified by the type of injury. Pick your classification. I like Mark Garcia Elias. So pick that classification and then look at how these repairs pan out over the years going forward at one year, two year, five years, and 10. So we can really see the differences that these different repairs will have on long-term outcomes. So that's just a plug. I mean, I, I'm really excited about all the work that's being done now. I think we have a chance at finally making a real dent in this problem that uh, Ron Lenscheid and Jim Dobbins brought to our attention 50 years ago. I mean, I've, you could almost say that we haven't really advanced that far. In answer to your questions, um, yes, I think the, from what I've learned is that in a patient with severe osteoporosis, I wouldn't do this. It's so dependent on getting a bite on those different bones uh, that you don't want to put um, synthetic tape and implants into soft bone. Uh, in that one case, it failed. I also, it's so good, this antifab repair is so good at bringing back your DZ that if you do have a lax wrist that tends to fall into VZ, it may convert you to a VZ, which I don't think is the end of the world. And that particular patient that went into some VZ is uh, doing quite well, but, but that's the thing. It'll tip the balance more towards VZ in a very lax patient, I think. Um, um, and when would I do something else? Um, yeah, like Mel said, if you've got a good strong repair or a strong ligament that you can repair, I, and it's an early case, I would try to do that. I, like, I still like that. Um, but I think the advantage of this repair is it really does cover all the bases. It gets your lower and dorsal con contributors to uh, lunate and triquetral stability that you really do have to address. One thing I would just throw in an element of caution uh, with the swivel lock repair, we're now looking at a, a series of patients who've had osteolysis and extrusion of these implants from the scapegoat and the lunate and just clear cut fractures and destruction of their proximal carpal row. So we're looking at that histologically. We're trying to figure out what it is, but I would just inject an element of caution. That's a lot of material to be putting in these very small bones. So just um, something to think about. Scott, that brings up a great point and, and, and maybe similar to the uh, uh, CMC uh, stabilization. Um, perhaps there have been some surgeons putting them in uh, beyond the, the biomechanical uh, tightness. So I, I think as Remy said, uh, it's, you can certainly over tighten these um, as has been done with the, the, the mini tightrope. And maybe that may be the cause that you're seeing. Sure could. Oh, don't bring the mini tightrope into this, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one last thing, one, one very interesting thing that we're, we're gonna publish shortly is that uh, the traditional capsular split, uh, we're concerned because that really does take down these ligament attachments of both the dorsal radio carpal and the dorsal intercarpal and the lunate. And be very careful if you do that, you're adding a, what, what is really an atrogenic instability on top of what's already a bad situation. So if you have to do that approach, and I did that for years, decades, but if you have to do that approach, make sure you hammer it back down with some good anchors and make sure you reattach those ligaments, very important. Very good points, uh, everyone. I, um... Unfortunately, we could go on forever. Unfortunately, it's, it's six o'clock our time, I guess nine o'clock on the East Coast. Um, I'd really, again, like to thank all of our fellows for outstanding uh, presentations. I'd like to thank the mentors for their comments. Uh, Jerry, do you want to take us home? Yeah, sure. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, the moderation, introduction, the overview. 
I agree all five fellows and thank you for all five mentors for your excellent coaching and presentations. I think great learning points and hope we get to keep this going for a while. I know folks are getting busy. As Warren mentioned, it's going to be every other week and going on to every month of kind of going forward in the academic year. But um, thank you all for joining us. So in two weeks, it's going to be on another very non-controversial topic on a DRG arthritis in terms of what's going to be the best treatment for that for a 25-year-old, a 50-year-old, and a potentially a 75-year-old rheumatoid. So hope you could join us and everybody stay safe and healthy out there. And again, thank you for joining us. And I, I want to make one point. These these uh, conferences go much better when you're drinking wine. <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm surprised to not see any other wine glasses there. Sanj, what do you have one hidden down below the desk or something? <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got milk. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not clocking in or something at the Mayo Clinic right now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Mark's got a whole vineyard behind him, so. Oh we yeah, to be sharp. we had to be sharp, Mel, with you and Scott coming at us. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, it was benign tonight. It was very benign. <laughs> We're among friends, of course. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Good job, Jeff. Good job, Jerry. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Jeff well, and Jerry, well, for, for putting you. it on. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Warren. Well, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jerry. Great job, guys. Take it easy. Take care.